Welcome back everyone to another reaction video as we continue our look at the first war of Scottish independence from our friends at History March. If you have not seen the first two episodes of my reaction to this series, a link is in the description. It'll take you back to the beginning. The link is also there to the original content without my commentary. Headed to the Shiloh battlefield this week. We're doing a meetup uh, for those who are available and can be in the area on Friday. I'll be posting uh, a separate announcement video just updating and reminding everybody about that as well as some future plans uh, later on. Uh, in fact, you probably will have already seen that video before this one goes live, unless you're a patron and you're seeing this a day early. Let's go ahead and dive into the battle. Falkirk, William Wallace's last stand. The year is 1298, and in the rebellious land of Scotland, one name is on the lips of every patriot. Indeed, the name William Wallace will be forever etched into the national psyche of Scots. So one thing I want to point out for those who may be curious about this, that since we're talking about 1298, you're seeing that some of the leading noblemen of the realm are earls, like the Earl of Norfolk, Roger Bygod. Uh, and Humphrey, the Earl of Hereford, Humphrey, Humphrey de Bowen, whose uh, story is going to get quite interesting later on. But um, you don't see a lot of dukes like you're going to see later on. And that's going to come about, I think, primarily another hundred years or so down the road in England is when you're going to start to see the rank of Duke become a pretty prominent thing. And it's going to be initially given out to members of the royal family, but eventually you'll have what would be considered to be non-royal Dukes as well. And so, for example, Norfolk's going to become a dukedom rather than an earldom as it is right now, and an earl's going to be a lesser title. The loyal supporter of the deposed King John Balliol, having jointly scored a spectacular victory over the army of John de Warren at the Battle of Stirling Bridge. Wallace pushed south in October of 1297 with an army of around 3,000 men. The Scots leader forging for himself a reputation for savagery as he torched and ravaged to Corbridge and Hexham. Before so it says here, according to an English source, Wallace would have captured English men and women sing naked before him before torturing them. Now remember, this is an English source. If you're an English source, what are you trying to do? You're trying to make William Wallace look like a scary, evil tyrant who does terrible things. So take that with a grain of salt. Uh, always consider when you're looking at the sources, what is their agenda? Who are they writing on behalf of? Who are they writing to? How close to the actual event are they writing? Did Wallace do this? Maybe. But it's also quite possible that this was made up to make him sound scarier and more awful. Give you a perfect example of this. During World War II, Japanese soldiers and civilians were told terrible things would be done to them by the United States military if they were captured. It's why so many of them took their own lives rather than surrender or be captured because they had heard these things. They weren't true, but they were said by the other side. So a lot of that kind of stuff happens. Now, what, what Wallace does not do is march all the way down to York and sack the town of York like you see in Braveheart. Before moving his unruly men into Cumberland and then Carlisle. Carlisle proved too tough to crack without siege equipment and hence all the Scots could accomplish was to blockade the English under Henry Percy while they continued to fire and destroy the lands around. So Henry Percy, marcher lord in the north, as the Percy family is for hundreds of years. Wallace with a 3,000-man army and probably not real deep in terms of supply. He's not going to be able to do anything deep into England. He's not marching on London or anything like that, right? He's going to be able to raid into northern England, and that's really about as far as it's going to go. But anything that they can do in England means it, it keeps the pressure off of uh, English armies coming into Scotland. Around it. Fortunately for the beleaguered English, they were not the Scots' most formidable opponent at that time, with the coming winter weather driving them back east towards Durham. This target too was foregone due to heavy snows, the Scots instead heading for Newcastle. However, Newcastle too remained untaken, 
The combination of foul weather and the Scots' own eagerness to return north with their plunder, driving Wallace back to his homeland by early December. On the surface, little was achieved by the raid, with three major targets remaining in enemy hands. So it was never really about taking and holding that territory. It's psychological, it's about grabbing supplies, food, plunder, things like that. However, the effects are more nuanced than mere territorial gain. Wallace and his Scots plundered abundantly, significantly adding to their war chest through plunder and extortion payments. The raid also served to both boost morale mm -hmm. and solidify Wallace's own position as the de facto leader of national resistance. The raid was just retribution for the Scots' own suffering at the hands of King Edward and his lieutenants. But the goal is to unite, right? We're, we've been talking about this, how Scotland is not united. In order to win, I mean, even a united Scotland is going to have a difficult time against the power of the English. But a united Scotland has a better chance. You get cracks in that. You get noblemen turning on each other. You get clans turning on each other. You can't do it. Perhaps common memories of the brutal sack of Berwick drove the avenging Scots on in those dying months of 1297. The Scots nobility, for its part, largely endorsed Wallace's actions, as at some point during the winter months of 1297 into 1298, the victor of Stirling Bridge was knighted by a major earl of the realm, perhaps even Robert Bruce, the future king and victor at Bannockburn. Wallace was also elected guardian of the kingdom in the name of King John Balliol, who still lived. And this is basically the highest honor that they can give Wallace, right? He's, not, he's got no claim to the throne. Uh, they're, they're not going to be giving landed titles, uh, like making him an earl or a duke or anything like that. Uh, but making him guardian of Scotland gives him this prestige that hopefully continues to get people to unite behind him. That's the hope. Scotland's champion now had official sanction and support of at least some of the nobility. He would need it, as if Stirling Bridge had achieved nothing else, it had provoked a unified drive in the English to crush the Scots in 1298. As for the English, they had not meekly hidden behind their walls in the aftermath of Stirling. Robert Bruce emerged around this time in rebellion, and Robert Clifford launched a raid of his own into Annandale in response. The battle had far from broken the resolve of the English, though the occupying forces had been largely driven out. By October 23rd, men to the number of 30,000 had been summoned, the muster of this force to centre at Newcastle by the December 6th. Assembling any kind of force at such short notice was no easy feat. In the event, some 18,500 advanced north earlier on in 1298, relieving the castles at Berwick and Roxburgh. So 18,500 Englishmen marching forward. Remember what was the size of Wallace's army that he marched into England with? About 3,000 men. Now, granted, in their own territory, they're going to be able to muster more than that, but they're, they're going to have a hard time countering a force of that size by the English. At this point, operations were paused on the orders of King Edward Longshanks himself, still present in Flanders. This may have been foolish, given the delay gave the Scots precious time to consolidate and brace for the inevitable response. However, Stirling must have heavily influenced this decision, the loss persuading Edward to personally oversee the reconquest of what he considered a rebellious vassal folk. At this point, it's helpful to circle back on the character and recent times of Edward. He had not presided over the loss at Stirling, instead overseeing English efforts against their rather old enemy, the French. In so remember, Edward is technically a vassal of the King of France, not for England, but for his titles in France. And he hasn't paid proper homage to those, uh, and so now you've got a, an issue of um, fighting going on there. It's all these complicated layers, right, of who owns what and who answers to whom and all those sorts of things. Flanders. 
Edward too had much to distract him from matters further north. Indeed, Edward had partially acted against the Scots to begin in 1296 due to their open alliance with the French. The enemy of my enemy is my friend, right? Edward's having issues with the French. He didn't pay homage. The French are going to seize his lands now. If you're fighting the English, it is a very natural alliance. That's what we're going to call it, the old alliance. You can even go to the World War I battlefields. You go to places like the Somme, and there is this uh, memorial to the Highlanders in Newfoundland uh, Memorial Park in Beaumont Hamel on the Somme battlefield. Uh, and it's a Scottish uh, unit, but it's in France. And so it's, it's, it recognizes, it acknowledges that alliance between the Scots and the French even there. The French King Philip, having confiscated Edward's lands in Gascony, proved another formidable opponent to vex the English monarch. Edward also faced problems with some of his own great nobles, specifically around this time led by the Earls of Norfolk and Hereford. Opposition to the king centered around the main complaints of excessive extractions in the form of prizes and taxation, as well as over military service in Edward's wars. This is an ongoing theme all throughout the, uh, this millennium basically, in England, uh, all going back to the beginning of England's existence. It's the relationship between the, the monarch and his subjects, in particular his nobles, uh, and, and the powerful nobles who are jockeying for influence and position and authority and rejecting the, the crown, uh, exerting too much authority or demanding too much uh, in taxation and in military service. And, and there's that push and pull that exists between nobles and, and monarch. While agreeing in principle to rendering military service, Norfolk famously refused at Salisbury in February of 1297, as Edward himself would not lead him on that occasion. Edward angrily declared, By God, Sir Earl, either go or hang which was smoothly parried with Norfolk's own response. By the same oath, O King, I shall neither go nor hang. Hmm. On the matter of taxation, the opposition in the form of Norfolk and Hereford even went so far as to block collection of taxes in the Exchequer itself on the very day Edward himself embarked for Flanders. The prospect for a unified front against the Scots thus looked bleak at best by the fall of 1297. So remember, this is quite a long time after the, the issue. This is, what, 100 years or so? Well, not quite 100 years, but um, after the time of King John and his issues and Magna Carta and the demand by the nobles for basic rights. And, and, and you're going to start to see this shift that happens to where the king's going to lose the power to tax directly, and it's going to have to be done through parliament. Uh, and, and that's how parliament's going to rein in the monarch, is with the purse strings. Edward's foray in Flanders achieved little. His grand coalition against the French proved a non-starter, the king of the Romans failing to support him, and the Flemish themselves were flaky in their allegiance, thus prompting Edward to move from Bruges to Ghent. Here, Edward had to stamp his authority on the recalcitrant citizens to fully control the place. It's probable that Edward received news of events in Scotland by early October. Certainly, on the 9th of the month, he had agreed a two-month truce with Philip, though he would remain in the area for a further six months. In England, the prince's government came to an agreement with the opposition with the confirmation of the charters of Magna Carta and of the forest. In addition, future exactions in the form of levies and prizes had to come through common assent of the realm. Edward officially okayed the agreement on the 5th of November. With a year-long truce agreed with the French on 31st of January, Edward finally returned to England by March. It's interesting the French would agree to this given their alliance with the, the Scots. They ha Philip had to know that what Edward was doing was buying time to be able to shift his focus onto Scotland for a while. But maybe France was ha in their own 
predicament where they needed the break. The king returned with a steely resolve to smash the Scots into renewed submission, evidenced with his move of the governmental HQ to York, where it would stay for six years. Hmm. Surrey's hastily assembled force was largely dismissed during the April and May months. Ed- so, I mean, that communicates a lot, right? If you're moving basically your seat of government to York, you're saying, I'm parked here for a while and I'm serious about this. And of course, this is going to be right at the end of Edward's life and he's not going to be able to complete what he goes to start. We're deciding to muster a better quality force to march on the Scots. Edward called upon just 2,000 English foot from the counties of Cheshire and Lancashire, respectively, with the vast majority being drawn from Wales. Cheshire, Lancashire, that's the area down around Manchester, that area. Edward mustering in all 10,500 foot from here. Total crossbowmen numbered around 500, with the cavalry numbering an impressive 2,200 of both paid and feudal men. The leadership roll call was also incomparable to Stirling. Eleven earls, the Bishop of Durham, and no less than 115 bannerets accompanied their king. This is big. Edward entered York on the May 26th and made his intentions for Scotland plain by making a pilgrimage to the shrine of John of Beverley, a figure especially associated with battle. With the banner of John, he processed to Durham, reaching it by 12th of June, and also taking the banner of Cuthbert, a saint famed as a defender of the English against the Scots. These holy banners were the very same who had driven the northerners to victory in 1138 against David I's invasion. As for the Scots, the swelling army of William Wallace was likely mostly based in the vicinity of Selkirk Forest throughout the spring and earlier weeks of summer. At Falkirk, the Scots would field a total of 9,500 men, 8,000 spears, and 1,500 archers. Such a force was substantial enough to cause logistical headaches even for experienced commanders. It's likely as the date of the battle loomed, Wallace thus moved his army to the Torwood for ease of supply and also to block the English route to Stirling. Notice how most of these battles that are taking place between the English and the Scots are going to happen not on the border, but deep into Scottish territory. This is kind of where the, the center of population is even today, right? Edinburgh, Glasgow, um, the population of Scotland, a big chunk of it is in that. It only takes an hour to drive from one to the other. Glasgow is the largest city. Edinburgh is the capital today. Um, so you're drawing them into the heart of your country, not only because now you can create the circumstances of the engagement, but also, as he mentioned, supply, uh, more favorable, uh, friendly people around. Uh, just you, you get yourself a lot of advantages, but it also is bad news for all the Scottish people who live on the borders. The Royal Army finally amassed at Roxburgh, the infantry marching from Carlisle, the whole host with Edward at its head, advancing north through a land already picked clean of resources by the Scots. This scorched earth policy was effective, with delays in supplies from sea causing rumblings in the invading force. Edward thus halted at Kirkliston near Edinburgh in July, increasingly angry at the slow supply situation. During this period of frustration, Edward sent the Bishop of Durham out to ravage three castles. The initial assault on Dalton was beaten back, but after stiff words of encouragement from Edward, the task was completed. Dalton was taken after supplies arrived to reinvigorate Durham's force and the other two were fired after their abandonment. Mm. This minor success was offset by trouble in the main English camp. Not all the supplies arrived at once. A large quantity of wine came before any significant load of food, and the larger Welsh contingent liberally indulged themselves with predictable results. Yeah, what could possibly go wrong with an army hundreds of miles from home and the wine arrives before the food does. 
But supply, I mean, yeah, supply, supply, supply. How many wars, how many battles have turned on the ability to supply your army effectively? Drunkenness combined with hunger devolved into a mass brawl that threatened the integrity of the royal army. The Welsh killing some priests who tried to calm the situation, prompting English men-at-arms to intervene. Wow. All in all, some 80 Welshmen were slain and the group withdrew apart from the army. This incident likely did not involve all the Welsh in Edward's army, but was damaging enough. It was at this low point that some good news finally came in. The earls of Dunbar and Angus presented the king with a spy who informed him that the Scots were around 18 miles west, waiting to pounce on the retreating English and raid their camp. With renewed vigor, Edward led his army west, camping at Linlithgow on the 21st of July. So this is this would have been a great opportunity for some counter-espionage, right? You could present a spy who gives false information and draws them into a trap. Of course, you'd probably die in the process, because if I'm Edward, I hang on to the spy until I find out if his information's accurate or not. Tensions were clearly high, as the royal host was ordered to remain arrayed for battle throughout the night. In a final minute. Why do that? Well, remember um, when we've studied what happened with Robert the Bruce, when we talked about him and we talked about his rebellion, he ran into an incident, right, where he met with um, the, I think it was Valence, uh, who's with Edward's army now, uh, and, and tried to negotiate and, and they put him off. And then in the middle of the night, they attacked. So you keep your men ready for battle just in case misfortune, Edward himself was wounded, but not by attacking Scots, but by his own horse, whom a careless squire had not secured properly. Nonetheless, the men mistook the commotion for an attack, panic quickly spreading before Edward himself painfully restored order. Mounting his steed, he proceeded towards Falkirk long before the dawn. Unlike Stirling Bridge, the exact site of battle is not definitively known. Since no precise landmarks distinguished it, there are candidates north and south of Falkirk itself. Wallace had positioned his men on high ground to the south of Calendar Wood. It's harder to tell where these battles were at this time before you have uh, cannon and you have um, handguns, things like that. Or, basically rifles, you know, muskets, whatever they would be at the time, because you don't have evidence left in large scale like you would at, say, a battle like Bosworth in 1485, where you're going to be able to find artillery and things like that, remnants of the battle. His 8,000 spearmen formed into four tightly packed circular shiltrons. Tactically, this was a sound move. The Scottish commander likely basing his decision on his knowledge of the English use of heavy cavalry. Since the Shiltrons were not anchored to any natural feature, their circular form would enable opposition to a charge from all directions. Guarding the gaps between the Shiltrons were Wallace's 1,500 bowmen, though their numbers paled in comparison to Edward's 5,500 longbowmen. The confluence of the Glen and West... Edward's got almost as many bowmen as Wallace has men in his army. ...first quarter burns created a boggy obstacle to any direct assault, funneling potential assaults towards the flanks. Guarding those flanks towards the rear to presumably oppose the charge of Edward's horse was about 500 cavalry under the command of James, the High Steward. Having settled on this stance, Wallace famously shouted to his stoutly arrayed Scots, I have brought you to the ring. Hop, if you can. Initially hesitant to immediately attack, Edward allowed his heavy cavalry to probe the Scots with an unsupported attack. The infantry were yet to fully deploy to the field, still advancing from Linlithgow. Charging in four battles, the Earls of Lincoln and Hereford as well as Roger Bigard, the Earl Marshal of England, led the vanguard, with Surrey's battle in support, 
while the right flank was led by the Battle of Antony Beck, the Bishop of Durham, as well as King Edward's battle. King Edward himself may have not directly engaged in the thick of the fighting, but would certainly have ridden with an elite bodyguard of chosen knights. He wants to be close to the battle, but at this point Edward's getting up there in years. He's, he's past the years when he's fighting on the battlefield himself. Initially, the charge was halted by the marshy terrain that had been unmarked. However, the battles quickly veered around and reorganized to attack the flanks instead. Lincoln's battle, outclassing and outnumbering the Scots cavalry on his wing, made quick work of them, killing or driving them from the field. Some Scots may have dismounted and escaped to the Shiltrans to continue the fight on foot, but what is sure is that the Scots cavalry was eliminated as a threat from the field. So these Shiltrans are basically your 1298 version of forming square at battles like Waterloo, right? This is your counter to a cavalry formation as you've got these long pikes that presumably can get at you know a man on horse and kill the horse before he can get close to you. As for the archers positioned between the Shiltrans, they too fell victim to the ferocious charge of the yeah. English horse. Should have had them in the center. Having wheeled around the marshy terrain in the center and approached the Scots army on the flanks, Riding to the rear and smashing into their formations, the archers stood little chance. The approach of the knights concealed by their own comrades braced in the Shiltrans. With the flight and fall of the Scots cavalry and archers, the royal battles refocused their wrath on the immobile but stalwart Scottish Shiltrans. This final challenge, however, proved a fight too far for the cavalry alone. Right. Yeah, I mean, that. It, this is rock, paper, scissors, right? This is how you beat cavalry, but now you're vulnerable to their archers, to their infantry. Edward's cavalry circled the bristling formation of spearmen, attempting to probe and smash their way through the gaps to no avail. The Scots' main infantry force thus remained unbroken for now. However, the English infantry were edging slowly towards engagement, and King Edward now deployed a deadly counter, his longbowmen. And again, this is exactly what you would do 600 years later in battle. If your cavalry can't break their squares, those squares are brutally uh, torn to pieces by artillery. These volleys of arrows and bolts shredded the forward ranks of Wallace's formations, with many of Edward's men even taken up and throwing stones to increase the pressure. Slow and methodical volleys of the deadly missiles thus eroded away the Scots rather than smashed through them as the cavalry had wanted. One source described the Scots falling like blossoms in an orchard when the fruit has ripened. Inevitably, the ranks of the Scots thinned and gaps began to appear, thus providing the cavalry the chance to force a path to cutting down the spearmen close up. With this breakthrough, the Scots' Shiltrans were compromised. However, they still easily outnumbered the English cavalry. Though our major source, Walter of Gisborough, makes no overt mention of the infantry moving in to complete the victory, this is highly likely. Many hundreds were killed, making for the relative safety of the woods. Included among those who did escape the disaster were William Wallace himself, along with a few of his inner circle. Wallace retreated north and made sure to gut Stirling as he did so, only leaving the house of the Dominican friars intact, which King Edward took as his headquarters. Don't leave anything for the enemy to be able to use, right? The defeat at Falkirk irreparably damaged the prestige of William Wallace. His brief authority and title of guardian had been reliant on his success, and now he resigned his post, retreating to his Vega role before his startling ascendancy a few months before. Right, and now there goes your chance to unite people, right? Now people are going to start thinking about, all right... William Wallace got beat on the battlefield. Edward's serious about this. He marched an army into our country we can't possibly hope to oppose. 
We need to start thinking about ourselves. We need to start thinking about how we get out of this. Wallace did serve his king as a diplomat, visiting the French court in 1299. He also may have visited Rome around the turn of the century, returning to Scotland by 1303. Yeah, there's, there's something you don't think about with Wallace, right? Wallace is an educated guy. He speaks fluent French, which um, I think they portray that in the movie uh, Braveheart. But yeah, he goes on diplomatic missions. He makes a pilgrimage to Rome. It's not like he's fighting, 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 fighting. Oh, he gets captured. Oh, he ta he's taken to London and executed. There's a lot of other stuff that happens in the meantime. As for Edward and his victorious host, despite heavy losses and the discrediting of Wallace, Falkirk was not a crushing end to Scots' resistance. Wallace would remain a painful symbol for English doubt throughout the period, a living example of how Edward's armies could be defeated. Wallace had been humbled, but the Scots patriot was still alive, and as the mighty English monarch aged inevitably to his own end, a new champion would rise to challenge and expel the hated English. The real Braveheart. If you stayed around this far, Robert the Bruce. We'll get to that. All right, let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below, and we will be back tomorrow with the next episode. Thanks for watching.